Okay, moving on. Question 5, part A. Some uh, work on simplifying algebra. When multiplying indices and the base numbers are the same, uh, you add the powers. So the answer for this is m to the 3 plus 5, which clearly is m to the power of 8. When dividing uh, index numbers and the base numbers are the same, you subtract the indices. So you would say this is m to the power of 4, subtract 6, which is m to the power of minus 2. Or you could write that as 1 over m to the power of 2. Now, 5 part C sometimes causes a few problems. I just want to show you uh, a little bit of background work and show you why this works. Say if I told you, if I asked you to simplify the fraction 3 times uh, 7 over 3 times 11, if I asked you to simplify that, i.e. 3 times 7 is 21 and 3 times 11 is 33. Well, you would say to me, 3 goes into top and bottom, so I divide top and bottom by 3, and I'm left with 7 over 11. But similarly, if it was, if the top is a product, or a set of multiple uh, numbers being multiplied, and the bottom is a set of numbers being multiplied, and there is the same number being multiplied on the top and bottom, to make my life easier, I could m cancel the 3 from top and bottom, and straight away say that fraction is 7 over 11. So I'm going to use that up here. I'm trying to simplify this. I'm just going to write it out a bit more fully. We've got a pi on top and we've got a cubed which means a multiplied by a multiplied by a. And that's all divided by 4 times pi times a. Now remember what I said here. If there is a number on the top and bottom that are in a multiplication you can cancel. So let's have a see if we can cancel anything. There's a pi on top and a pi on bottom, an a on top and an a on bottom and they're in multiplications. So that means we're left with the square root of a times a which is a squared over 4. And when we're taking the square root of a fraction we can take the square root of the numerator and divide it by the square root of the denominator. The square root of a squared is simply a and the square root of 4 is 2. So the answer to this problem is a over 2 or a divided by 2. Okay let's keep going. Question 6 part a. There is a sequence. A sequence is a list of numbers ordered in some way and it goes 2 7, 17, etc. It says the rule for finding the next term in this sequence is to multiply the term, the previous term, that's the term before, by 2 and add 3. Let's check it's right. 2 times 2 is 4, plus 3 is 7, correct. 7 times 2 is 14, add 3 is 17, correct. It says work out the next term. So step 1. 17 multiplied by 2 is 34 and step 2 34 plus 3 is 37 so the next term is simply 37 a very easy mark okay part b it says the rule for finding the next term in a different sequence is to multiply the previous term by 2 and add on a this time a it says is an integer. That means it's a whole number. The first term is 8, the fourth is 127, work out A. You may, there's no clear method how to work out A here, but what I would say to you is follow your nose and just write down the sequence uh, as described, try and get from one term to the other and see if that helps you. So you know the first term is equal to 8. You've got that. Now the second term. It tells you that what you have to do is multiply the term before by 2 and add on a. So to get the second term you take the 8, you multiply it by 2 and then you add on an a at the end. And that would be 16 plus a. What's the third term? 
Well, again, the term before the second, which is 16 plus a, you multiply 16 plus a by 2 and add on an a. Well, if you double all this, 2 lots of 16 plus a is 32 plus 2a, and you've still got to add on your a. So the answer to this is 32 plus 3a. Well, what's the fourth term then? Well, what do you do? You double the term before, 32 plus 3a, and you add on an a. So doubling that, you would get 64 plus 6a, plus an a is 64 plus 7a. So the fourth term is 64 plus 7a. But you also know the fourth term is 127. So you could make this algebraic expression equal to 127 and say 64 plus 7a is equal to 127. And you could solve this to find a. So I would subtract 64 off both sides and get 7a is equal to 63. And then I would divide both sides by 7 to get a is equal to 9. And hence your answer, a equals 9. OK, moving on. Question 7. I hope this is visible to you here. It's, it's quite small, but hopefully you should be able to see. An activity centre hires out road bikes and mountain bikes. The graph shows the cost C of hiring a road bike for D days. Circle the correct formula uh, for the cost of hiring a road bike. OK, let's just remember, this is a straight line graph. And when we think of straight line graphs, we think of the formula Y equals MX plus C. Y is the Y axis here. X is the x-axis here. C is what's called the y-intercept. So C is where the straight line crosses the y-axis. And M is called the gradient. That's how steep the line is. OK, so let's look at this uh, straight line here. If we look at it here, we can see that actually, in this case, uh, the y-axis is actually the capital C axis, the cost, and the x axis is actually the number of days, little d. So we can we know that the formula we're looking for, we're looking for something like C equals MD plus little c. This graph crosses at 5, so the y-intercept is 5, so big C equals something like MD plus 5, C is equal to 5. As you go across one unit, you go up 10 pounds, 5, 10 pounds. So the gradient M is 10. So C is equal to 10D plus 5. So it must be that one. Now be careful here. What students will do, they'll make a mistake. That they have purposefully um, adjusted the scale on the C or the Y axis here. As you go across 2, some students will say you go up 2. So the gradient's uh, 2. But you've got to be careful. Each of these squares is not worth value 1. You're actually going up 10 pounds. That's why the gradient's D. It then says, so this was the cost of uh, hiring a road bike. That was a road bike there. It says the cost of hiring a mountain bike is given by this formula here. Rowan would like to hire a mountain bike. And he thinks the mountain bike will always cost more than the ro road bike. Is he true? Well, you know what? Why don't we just draw that graph? We know how to draw this. It, C equals 5D plus 15. It crosses. The y-intercept is 15. And the gradient is 5. So if we start over here at 15, the gradient of 5 means as you go across 1, you go up 5. So you go here, across 1, up 5. And you can imagine that the graph looks something like that. And that then is the cost of hiring a mountain bike. Now, if you look at these two graphs together, the road bike, is it true that the mountain bike will always cost more? Well, it does cost more here because the line's higher than the road bike. 
But after two days, the mountain bike is less. So is what he said true? Well, no, it isn't. Why? After two days, it's more, it's cheaper. And you could say C graph. You can direct the graph you've drawn above to demonstrate that for you. Okay, let's move on. Question eight. Greg thinks of a positive whole number smaller than 15. He subtracts four, then doubles the result. Then he does it again. He subtracts four and doubles the result. He repeats the process several times. He stops when he gets an answer of 40. Show that when Greg starts with 12, he gets 40. Just lay your working out very sensibly. So you start off with 12, just step one. The first thing you do is you do 12 take away 4 is equal to 8. Step 2, you do 8 multiplied by 2, which is equal to 16. Step 3, it says you take that number, 16, you subtract 4 and you get 12. And then step 4, you do 12 multiplied by 2 and you get 24. Let's keep going with this. Step 5, you do 24 multiplied minus 4. Is 20 and step 5 you do 20 multiplied by 2 which is 40. And that is what you're trying to show there. You have shown that when you started with 12 and did this cyclical process, this process that kept repeating, you get 40. You could do this by trial and error or you could be a little clever about it. You could say to yourself, well you know that when you started with 12 you got 40. You know when you put 12 in, you got your 40 out, which is what you wanted. But imagine you had done this process of subtracting 4 and doubling one time before uh, to get the 12. That is to say that suppose you started with some number and you subtracted 4, got another number, and you then doubled it and you got 12. And then once you know you've got 12, you know 40 is going to come out. Well, what must this number be? Well, going backwards from 12 to this box, you must have to half it, so it must have been 6. And going backwards from here to the first box, you'd have to add 4, so it must be 10. So when you start with the number 10, I'm saying, and you subtract 4, you get 6, and double it, you get 12. From that point, you know that keeping the process going, you will get 40 from part A. So 10 is a good answer for part uh, for part B